All right. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us um, on our episode three, uh, multifamily um, investing out of state. Uh, today we have a special guest, um, Rohan uh, Jahar. Am I pronouncing that correct? Yeah, you got it. Fantastic. Um, so today um, we have Rohan Jahar. Um, he's the co-founder uh, of uh, JT Capital uh, Lead Acquisition and uh, investor relations. Uh, so uh, Rohan wears uh, many hats. Uh, I'm gonna move on to our next slide here. Um, so here's a quick introduction uh, mission statement from uh, Multifamily Masters. Uh, Multifamily Masters were um, a community to uh, connect people, educate people and empower people uh, through uh, real estate. And um, we're also uh, in three different countries um, currently, right now, we have 43 chapters. As of last month, we, um, we had about 5,300 members. So uh, since the last time we had uh, the WebEx, uh, we've increased it to about 5,600. So we encourage everyone to uh, join us for free um, on, uh, here we go, uh, multifamilymasters.com on Facebook. Uh, you can also um, watch our previous videos and our future videos. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, it's under a Multifamily Masters um, San Francisco chapter. And just a quick disclaimer, uh, this video is not a recommendation to sell security. It is for education purposes only. What you learn here is not considered legal or financial advice. Please consult a legal financial professional for your specific needs. And this next screen here is our contact. Uh, please feel free to take a snapshot. All right, perfect. So uh, Agnes, you wanna kick off the introduction for Rohan? Sure, um, Rohan um, is the guy who left Silicon Valley and Facebook to invest in multifamily apartment complexes. Um, Rohan is the co-founder of JT Capital, which has managed a multifamily real estate portfolio of 500 million. He has 10 years of experience in investing in real estate, finance, and operations. Early in his career, he worked in strategy and finance at Facebook and GE as a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. Outside of JT Capital, he leads Jahar Consulting, where he advises hedge funds, investment banks, and private equity shops on investing in tech companies and real estate deals. So definitely a wealth of knowledge, not just in real estate, but um, in different aspects of investing. So we're very excited to have him here um, and you know, to talk about how he got started in tech and how um, he transitioned to multifamily real estate investing and how he moved from San Francisco to Austin. I, <laughs> um, I can't wait to hear about it. I think we just moved about two months ago. Yeah, exactly. We moved a couple months ago uh, you know, from the Bay Area down, down to Austin. Yeah, I would love to hear how, you know, how you, how, so how did you get started in tech and how did you transition from tech to um, real estate? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I got started in tech by uh, moving from a prior company, uh, going over to work at Facebook. Uh, initially, when I worked at Facebook, you know, I was really focused on uh, kind of developing the, the trust and safety team and continuing to scale that organization globally uh, as they kind of faced, uh, you know, a variety of issues as it related to objectionable content on the platform, uh, election interference, which obviously is very topical today. Uh, but through that role, I had also really worked on um, a variety of our real estate expansion because what we were doing at the time was hiring about 15,000 people. And so what I got kind of well-versed in was understanding what does it mean when you go open up a Facebook office in a particular location or market? And what are the second and third order effects of that uh, not only of kind of like that local region where you open up a Facebook office, but also uh, the, the kind of population that grows, the jobs that grow, and the talent that grows, as well as the kind of second and third order effects for other real estate asset classes in that region. And so through that experience, I had really gotten a lot of exposure to real estate. Um, I found myself being more interested on the real estate side of things versus kind of the internal workings of the company. Um, and so with that, I had kind of transitioned into doing an apprenticeship for somebody that I had met and really admired uh, who had been doing multifamily for some time. Um, and then at that point, kind of, you know, 
started to learn the ropes. What does it mean to underwrite deals? What does it mean to go find deals? What does it mean to raise capital and then invest and operate real estate deals? Um, I did a, uh, a little stint in kind of venture capital right after Facebook. And that really helped me kind of hone my investing um, mindset and looking at different asset classes. And as I kind of surveyed the landscape, I got back to real estate because I truly believed that it was the best risk adjusted return asset class. Uh, and I viewed it as a uh, just great growth opportunity, not only for myself, but my investors as well. Great. And so were you doing real estate on the side while you were doing venture capitalists? Yeah. So, you know, I think it probably helped to provide some context. Uh, you know, I tell people that I actually got started in real estate when I was like seven years old. Uh, I was originally born and raised in Michigan. Uh, my dad, he had owned uh, kind of single family houses in Detroit, in the outskirts of Detroit. Uh, and so at a young age, he was kind of taking me along to go fix up these houses and things like that. Um, and, you know, after, um, you know, growing up, I went to Michigan State University, I kind of had a very tracked career, right? It was finance, it was strategy type work, and then it was the tech work. Um, now, when I moved from my prior role at GE, where I was really focused on finance, strategy, operations, as well as mergers and acquisitions, uh, at that point, I had moved over to Facebook. Now, the program I was in, pretty much the way it worked is you travel the world 100% of the time for your, your job assignments, and you effectively get to take home 100% of your pay because everything is paid for. So when I moved to Silicon Valley, um, I had kind of a network of people through my cousin who was an entrepreneur out there, and I started just realizing all the different investing opportunities. Um, and so I started investing on the LP side in real estate while I was at Facebook, and that kind of gave me my first uh, you know, vision into the asset class, and then obviously started working more as a hands-on um, uh, a team member, but that again, that was specifically at Facebook. When I went to go uh, leave to do the small stint in venture capital, at that time, I was looking at real estate on the side as an investing opportunity. Right. And so what are some of the advice for, we have some members who are in tech that want to transition to real estate. What are some of the challenges um, uh, that you faced? And now that you're, you're fully jumped into real estate, like any advice you have? Yeah. So, you know, when I first started, I um, effectively had said, you know, I had a strategy at that time, which was I want to go buy uh, a portfolio of single family homes in college towns. I believe college towns to be resilient for some period of time, maybe the next five or 10 years, depending on what your stance is on how, you know, our institutional educational system will evolve. Um, and so I decided I will buy one house uh, in a college mm -hmm. town, and then I'll expand to another house and another house and kind of grow linearly in that fashion. Um, and I uh, met with someone at the time and I explained to them kind of what my strategy was. I was kind of bouncing ideas off people to make sure that that made sense. And he gave me some of the best advice, you know, I've probably ever gotten because it helped kind of shift my mindset, which was do not do that. Uh, I started that and I moved to multifamily after about a decade because I realized it was very tough to scale a single family home portfolio. And effectively, the amount of time and effort that you put into um, purchasing a single family home and to rent it out and maybe to cash flow a few hundred dollars a month, you might be able to just, or you can do that same amount of time, effort, and work on a much larger deal. Now, on the much larger deal, you're going to have a different set of responsibilities, a different mindset. Uh, and so for me, I kind of took a step back, looked at what those uh, skills are needed to be able to perform an acquisition. And I felt that based on my previous experience, I did have that skill set. I think the one thing that, uh, you know, kind of sets apart doing the bigger deals versus the smaller deals is on the bigger deals, it's better to have a team around you, right? Uh, and then two, uh, obviously you need to raise investor capital in most cases, because most, if you're buying a, you know, let's say 20 million, 30 million, $40 million apartment complex, um, you can really only finance maybe, you know, aggressively 80% is debt, the other 20%. So at least, you know, up to 10 million you would need is equity. Um, and so that was kind of, you know, the advice that I give to people is really step back because a lot of people just shoot to the single family homes. Look at all the investor, uh, the asset classes, single family homes, industrial, 
um, multifamily, office, retail, et cetera. What is the one that really fits your uh, temperament and appetite as an investor before kind of just jumping in? Because I think a lot of people just jump into the single family home route because that seems to be the, the, the playbook that is out there that most people see. Yeah, it's definitely um, easier to get into, but it, it's hard to scale. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. speaking of your playbook, <clears throat> so uh, with your with your playbook, with uh, COVID-19, how did you have to pivot uh, your playbook? You know, with forecasting or data, yeah, how do you, you know, look at all this and put it all together? Uh, maybe you can explain a little bit of that, how you, you know, your thought process on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, pre-COVID, as we were doing acquisitions, one of the things that we always kind of look at and is core to our strategy, which is uh, risk mitigation, right? So when we enter a market, um, you know, our strategy is twofold. One, we go into markets that have good population growth, good job growth, and diversity of job growth, um, states and, and regions that are business and landlord friendly, um, and then lastly, places that have temperate climates. This has been... Um, primarily in the Sun Belt region, right? So kind of like that, uh, that, that Southwest, South, Southeast area. So that's one way that we've mitigated risk, right? Before we even purchase the asset. The second is then when we go look at a property, really what we're looking at is for uh, typically a B-class property. We're looking for something that is minimum 150 units and kind of our sweet spot is 300 to 400 units. Uh, and then we're looking for the right demographics on the property of the people that are going to be living there. So we look for people that have resilient jobs. We look for a property that has a higher median income living at that property. And we look for um, a, a, a property that we believe we will be able to add value through, through interior renovation, unit right. renovations, and um, you know, uh, really good uh, and high quality management. So before we even purchase the assets, what we look at is kind of all of those risk mitigation strategies, because we are very acutely aware of in a downturn, we need to have good residents on the property that can continue to pay rent. Now, as it relates specifically to COVID-19, the way that we approached it was pretty much, um, you know, in late February, uh, had started taking a look at the demographics of residents at our properties. Uh, where do they work? What is their income level? Um, and what is what we believe to be their ability to continue to pay rent or be adversely affected. And what we identified was that we had about 85% of our um, uh, uh, residents that we were 95% plus confident that they would be able to continue to pay rent. The remaining 15% 15 were uh, primarily in the range of, let's say, 85 to 95% confidence, and then the remaining about like 5% of that subset we just weren't able to really determine it. And so we felt comfortable being able to continue distributions to our investors. We never had to stop distributions. Um, and so from a financial perspective, we were okay. We just monitored things on a weekly basis. Our uh, property management team being in communication with the residents to make sure that people still had their jobs. If they were losing their jobs, we were able to put them on a payment plan. Um, and then operationally, things just changed in terms of um, you know, social distancing in our clubhouses where our leasing agents sit, um, uh, some nuance around how we had maintenance people go into the apartments and, uh, you know, fix work orders. Um, and then lastly, just um, more kind of uh, best practices around social distancing, mask wearing and temperature checks when people wanted to come into the office or rent an apartment. We started implementing things like virtual tours. So, Thankfully, we've been able to mitigate risk through purchasing high quality assets in high quality locations. And then, you know, once something occurs, we just do the analysis to make sure that we were right. And then two, we implement some of those operational improvements to make sure we're keeping people safe. Fantastic. Yeah, you got to think a little differently in this environment. Now. You got to uh, risk uh, management. Um, so great job there. Uh, <clears throat> moving on to the next question I have for you. So pretty simple question. Why Austin, Texas? Because everyone's excited about Texas, but why Austin, Texas? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, Austin to me kind of came down to um, uh, like a handful of reasons, right? So one was specifically related to technology. Uh, tech jobs in Austin have grown about three times the national average 
uh, over the past handful of years. The average salary there for tech jobs is $137,000. Um, now, $137,000 might not seem like a lot in the Bay Area, but when you adjust that for the cost of living and kind of normalize it across every uh, city in the entire United States, that's about $224,000, which is number one in the country in terms of how far your money can go. Uh, the number two city being Denver at roughly $202,000. So that was one real reason we really liked it. We saw these kind of high quality tech jobs going into there uh, with a component of kind of this um, ability to have a stronger purchasing power. Uh, two, kind of, you know, feeding off that, it was the lower cost of living. So, you know, I think COVID has been an, uh, uh, a catalyst for accelerating this movement to not only remote work, but also kind of the work from anywhere trend, right? Where these companies have opened up offices in tier two cities, in tertiary markets, and people are realizing um, that, you know, maybe I don't have to live in a San Francisco or in New York to be able to still have a fulfilling career and everything like that. And so they've moved from apartments in those bigger cities, uh, you know, to living in, in a place like Austin, Texas. And there's other tier two markets that, that have that as well. Uh, three, it is business and landlord friendly. Um, so I would argue that Texas is probably one of the most uh, friendly states to businesses, uh, no state income tax, coupled with a government that really kind of uh, crafts regulation around um, helping businesses uh, thrive and flourish. Um, the, the jobs I'll kind of go back to as the fourth reason, not only check jobs, but we've just seen a proliferation of, of jobs, uh, you know, increasing in Texas. And then lastly, fifth, kind of feeding off that is just the population growth. So as the population grows, as the jobs grow, they kind of go hand in hand. And we've seen Austin's population grow 32% over the last decade, which is about four wow. times the growth of the U.S. national average. Uh, today, Austin's metro population is roughly 2 million people. And so that kind of gives us a lot of demand uh, for housing, for apartments. Uh, and with housing being kind of constricted, um, it makes housing prices go up, which makes multifamily a very attractive, uh, attractive uh, kind of destination for people looking to move. Yeah, that's um, so. I know a lot of people have either moved or are thinking about moving to Austin. Um, can you share what life is like now living in Austin? And are you meeting <laughs> a lot of people from San Francisco? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh, we met our neighbors. Uh, we just moved, uh, moved, uh, and we had met our neighbors last week. Uh, and when I met him, he said, "I bet I can tell you where you're from." <laughs> and I was like, "Where?" And he was like, "California." And I was like, how did you know? And he's like, everyone from California is moving here. Uh, so I think, yeah, definitely you've seen a lot of people move uh, from kind of uh, the Bay Area, uh, California uh, in general, uh, New York, some of these higher tax states. Um, and they kind of, you know, d you do the checklist, right? One, where are all my friends moving? I had a significant amount of friends that were moving to places like Austin, also Denver um, and, and uh, Los Angeles. Um, I think that you've seen kind of, um, you know, a, a, a good quality of life, right? So either you can move into a place like Austin in a multifamily apartment complex uh, that might be a class A building and might be much nicer than what you had been living in on the coast, coastal cities, uh, but also paying less, right? Or for people that are maybe, um, you know, on the cusp of kind of building families, what they're looking for, again, is like a place where you're still finding good uh, talent, um, a level of intellectualism in the, in the city, uh, a level of uh, kind of like good nightlife, quality of life, but a little bit more space, right? And so Austin seems to be one of those places that provides kind of this uh, plethora of characteristics that a San Francisco has or a New York has to a certain degree. Uh, and you kind of judge those trade-offs uh, as an individual. And I think a lot of people have have um, you know moved to Austin and, and Dallas uh, is the two major cities in in, in Texas uh, as a destination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I have investment properties in Austin, but I haven't lived there. But last time I was there, our Uber driver told us that we have to do this. It's called Chicken Shit Bingo. So it's okay. like a bingo card, but the chicken lays shit on it, and then like. <laughs> 
like three or whatever, but they might not be open. Um, if they're open, I think you need to try that and let us know. How. <laughs> I'll have to check that out. I have not it's heard of that. Weird. <laughs> weird fun stuff in Austin. But yeah, to check out and let us know. Definitely. I do want to pick your brains in regards to uh, the neighboring uh, cities around Austin, um, you know, the submarkets and whatnot. What information have, or what have you, you know, um, what information have you found around that area? And are those submarkets even growing too because how hot Austin is? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we look at Austin, a lot of people will kind of just zone in on the central business. Uh, district of Austin, which is kind of downtown, our strategy is actually to kind of zoom out a little bit and look at some of those surrounding areas. The reason I say that is because uh, in any city or any in any location, you always have a path of progress, right? So as the central business district um, gets developed and, and, and kind of established, then the path of progress continues to grow outward in certain areas, right? Offices get set up, retail gets set up, medical offices get set up, homes get set up, multifamily, so on and so forth. And so we've actually seen um, more resiliency in what I would call um, kind of the, the suburban markets or the uh, path of progress outside the central business district. And so you see places kind of like uh, the domain, which is you know 25 minutes uh, outside uh, of downtown Austin, uh, places like uh, you know, Round Rock or Georgetown, which again are like 30 to 35 minutes outside of the downtown. But each one of these locations kind of establishes a unique footprint of the right. demographic right. of person that they're trying to attract, uh, of the retail footprint, and now kind of, you know, these city centers that get developed in these areas. So oftentimes these are um, very attractive places for people to live because you get kind of a, a city center, a downtown feel without being truly in the downtown. And if you want to travel there, you can because it really only takes 30 minutes to get there. Uh, but you're able to kind of live in an area where you have a lower cost of living, again, even within the, the type of lower cost uh, region. Um, and also you kind of get all the benefits of the space and the quality of life. So absolutely, um, you know, I think the outskirts of Austin have been developed significantly um, and they're attractive investment opportunities. And um, we've seen a lot of, um, you know, uh, exciting things there. Uh, and quite frankly, that's where we target uh, kind of our, our, our assets that we purchase. Yeah, so Fantastic. talking about kind of the northern, like north of downtown Austin. Um, so I know Tesla's moving, uh, opening their plant in East Austin. Are you seeing mm -hmm. developments there? What are you seeing then? Yeah, so Tesla's opening up uh, a couple of places. So they have a gigafactory. They have another kind of factory. Um, the one that's being opened up in kind of, uh, you know, that eastern part of Austin um, is probably going to bring roughly around 5,000 jobs. Uh, you know, the news is big and the headlines are big. Um, I think those jobs, they take a little bit of time to fill, right? So it's going to take at least a few years to be able to staff people up there. But already what you see is kind of investment activity picking up, right? People wanting to either buy land in the area, sell land, excuse mm -hmm. me, or something along those lines because... Uh, they see it as kind of a you know a potential growth opportunity. To me, the 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 narrative and the real story is just the continued growth of companies setting up in Austin, right? So I think Tesla being there, Apple being there, Facebook being there, Amazon being there, so on and so forth. You continue to see these uh, companies shifting or growing their, their their assets and their locations in an area like this. Um, and so you know the the. The first order effect is that, yes, we will have some um, uh, addition of jobs going into there. But I think the second and third order effect is more about kind of like the culture and the feeling of more people seeing that news and then right. more people either wanting to move or companies wanting to establish locations there. And so the story in the headline is kind of the what I call like the, 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 the punch, but then really what happens after ends up being more impactful for the region. Mm -hmm. And you, I know you believe that Austin's going to be the next major, like San Francisco, New York. What are some of the criteria that um, that you that Austin has that you think it could be the next major? Yeah, so I think there's this kind of um, you know narrative of uh, democratization of capital. So you know, let's say historically, so much of the venture capital investment happened on Sand Hill Road, uh, you know, in Menlo Park or in Palo Alto, and then. You know, you kind of have the, these startups flourish uh, 
uh, uh, going up into San Francisco uh, on the coastal, uh, the other coast in New York, you've seen uh, a significant amount of venture activity as well. But, um, and then after that, you've seen kind of little hubs pop up, right? Even in smaller cities so that you wouldn't think about such as Detroit or Cleveland or Minnesota, you've seen small venture capital type activity. Arguably one of the um, higher uh, venture capital activity locations outside of the coastal cities in Los Angeles has been Austin. But now I kind of just follow the trend of where are intelligent people going that mm -hmm. are building companies uh, that are founders, that are uh, uh, comes along with engineering talent, and then where are venture capitalists kind of traveling to or meeting with people? And what I found through kind of anecdotal evidence and kind of just being on the ground now has been that Austin has been this place where there's a lot more of this activity. And I think you've seen some of these uh, companies get get founded. More recently, Rig Up is probably the, the most recent one, which is a unicorn company that was invested in by A16Z, uh, headquartered out, out of Austin. Um, and so I think you know that's kind of what it will end up being. There's obviously this bias now that I'm here, uh, but at the same time, I think the, the, the more unicorns that actually flourish in a city like Austin, that will really, really leave the footprint. But I think if you're looking for a leading indicator, you just follow the activity that's happening in the location. That's really good insight because we hear about big companies like Apple, Facebook, but you know it's good to know also the VCs are there. So that, that's really mm -hmm. healthy, really good info that you're sharing. Um, so let's talk about, you know, is it a good time to invest in Austin now? Uh, I, th I think so. Uh, so we, uh, me and my partners, uh, Pooja and Sapin at JT Capital, uh, we have been investing in Austin significantly. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, deals pretty much every day. I am touring assets every week. Um, and I'm seeing, you know, pretty, pretty good, good deals out there. Um, obviously, in the environment that we're in, there's a little bit of uncertainty on one end of the barbell. And then on the other end of the barbell, there's kind of this aggressiveness. We kind of sit in an area where we say, you know, we like to focus on things that are in our control. We're acutely aware of the macroeconomic environment, but on every single deal, we're really zoned in on what is happening in this particular location, who is living at this property, uh, what do the age receivables look like, are people paying rent, all of those kinds of things. So we're checking the boxes because we believe that if you're buying a high quality asset in a high quality location, you will have the ability to be able to generate cash flow. And that's what we've seen. We recently closed on a 308 unit deal um, the other week in Austin. Um, and this is a deal where we look at uh, a place that has significantly below market rents and uh, a strong asset base uh, of, of residents. And so we believe we can continue to increase rents, which effectively provides our investors with increased cash flow over time. Right, um, must be so nice to be able to visit your assets without flying in and look at different assets without flying in. <laughs> yeah, it has been a great advantage. You know, I think sitting in, in San Francisco, um, it worked It worked well. Um, most of our assets were in Florida. I flew there maybe once every six to eight weeks. Uh, but I think being on the ground gives such a, like from a feeling perspective, just a better sense of control. Uh, and then truly being on the ground, I can kind of, you know, drive by the asset. I pretty much drive by every few days uh, across our properties to see how things are going. I can take pictures of things I see that's going well or needs to be fixed and immediately send them over to our, uh, you know, operations VP and she's able to take care of those things. And so I think it provides that increased level of oversight that you don't necessarily have sitting out of state. Mm -hmm. Right. So speaking to our... Um our active investors and our passive investors. Uh, currently right now, how many frogs do you really get a kiss before you can, before you find a deal? Um, you know, we're hearing a lot of, uh, you know, properties out there that are up, but they're getting a lot of these other deals that uh, aren't even worth it. So how many deals are you really looking at? And, you know, um, you know, um, breaking down the numbers and whatnot. So are you experiencing more or less than pre COVID? Um, I think now we're experiencing, we're, we're back to the same level of activity, maybe even a slightly higher level uh, since pre-COVID. Um, you know, I think during COVID, pretty much 
a significant amount of activity just stopped, right? Deals that did come onto market, if um, buyers were kind of wary, they would either back out if they didn't see something that they liked, or quite frankly, they just had troubles on the lender side, right? Um, and, and now since, um, you know, we're still in the middle of COVID, but I would say at least in Austin and Dallas, some of the restrictions have been lifted. And it seems like you're getting back to some more type of semblance of normal life. And so because of that, we've seen a higher level of investment activity now with sales, uh, uh, with deals coming on market. Now the lenders are still very um, uh, kind of being being strict and making sure. sure that they are putting a, 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 a more focused lens on deals, which I think is a very good thing. Um, so for example, they may be requiring debt service reserves of maybe nine to 12 months, uh, or they may be requiring kind of looking at an age receivables list every week to making to make sure people are paying rent uh, continuously. Right. Um, and so I think the, the other piece of it that I would add is that some with the election coming up, there's a level of uncertainty. So some owners feel like they want to sell before because they just don't understand what the impact of a, a new president could be. We look at that as an opportunity. We don't necessarily kind of run from that. Uh, and so there's a variety of factors, but I would say the biggest one is that, you know, just things have opened up, therefore investment activity levels are continuing to get back to normal, at least here in Austin and Dallas. That's a good thing. Um, we're, we're always looking for new opportunities. And also, you know, how would you forecast the next maybe uh, two years or three years or even five years? Yeah, you know, it's really always tough to say. So, um, I, I tend to kind of uh, at least pr provide my uh, insights with a caveat of, you know, I really don't know. Uh, but to give a sense of kind of how I think probabilistically things are, are playing out um, it is kind of in the following. So, um, you know, as we look to, to, to the rest of the year, at least uh, from a multifamily perspective, you have the eviction moratorium still in place. So, um, you know, it's very hard to evict people. However, if people are taking advantage of uh, the current situation, um, it's, they can still be evicted, right? So that is a good thing and a bad thing, both for landlords and residents, uh, as well as like a social good perspective, right? People who are truly affected um, are able to kind of be saved by this safety net, which I think is a good thing. And I would imagine, at least for myself as a landlord, I believe it's a good thing. Um, people who are taking advantage and try to kind of, you know, skirt the system uh, will be negatively affected, which is also, I believe, a good thing because, you know, you should be following kind of the, the, the true general guidelines. Right. Um, if you are buying ass high quality assets in high quality locations with an appropriate amount of leverage and margin of safety, then you should be okay, right? In the event that, you know, some people stop paying rent, as long as you've bought, bought a good asset with a good resident base, then you should not have that worry. However, if you're buying in places where let's say maybe it's a C-class asset and look at the unemployment rate today of 8% and a, a significant amount of those people might be in lower paying jobs, then you might be in significant trouble, right? So that's not good for the current owner, but for people who are looking for distressed opportunities, that's a great opportunity because some of these people will not be able to make their mortgage payments. Uh, the bank may not work to restructure debt with them and those kinds of things. Um, and so at least for us, that's why we kind of still believe in, in the kind of higher quality, let's say B and A type assets. Um, and then outside of that, I think everything uh, uh, besides that is kind of just speculation. Uh, I think that you know a lot of this will just depend on the virus and kind of how each um, each kind of region or state or city kind of reacts to it, right? So if, you know, you have um, a huge type of second or third wave, obviously that can be very uh, disastrous for a variety of reasons. However, if you don't, and we're kind of just on this curve that we have been on for, for the, the past, you know, handful of months or so, and states individually end up making decisions on opening up or closing down, then, I believe those states will be affected in that similar way, right? So when you kind of look at the, the, across the U.S. and so you see how different governments have reacted, if you're purely looking at it from an economic standpoint, 
then it's very clear who continue to kind of um, at least not get hurt too bad, who continue to remain steady state. Um, and that's putting aside kind of any, you know, health uh, uh, or mortality consequences. Um, and so I think it's, it's tough to kind of tell a story of the, the, the U.S. broadly, but I think it's going to depend on each state and how they continue to react to kind of the ongoing situation. Um, so that's kind of how I think about it. Really, uh, to summarize, I think it's for us, we like to focus on buying those high quality assets in high quality locations at a conservative leverage point. Um, and that always provides us with enough margin of safety because really for us, uh, you know, I think as Warren Buffett said, the number one rule in investing is uh, don't lose money. And the number two rule is don't forget rule number one. Uh, but really, you know, you, you're in tech, right? You're in San Francisco. So if you think about it, maybe that rule doesn't apply in venture capital, right? But that rule really does apply in real estate. Uh, and so for us buying these asset backed uh, kind of, um, um, or these like property backed assets that allows us to have this margin of safety. And, you know, if anything happens, we know that we can ride it out because we do not uh, kind of lever these things up as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. You make a pretty strong point on uh, <clears throat> the market that you're investing in and whatnot. Uh, it, it's key. So if you're picking a market that has, you know, <clears throat> like what you said, C property with, you know, um, a lot of job losses, uh, that market wouldn't be a good market. Uh, so with, with the Austin market at the, at the moment, do you feel that it might be, you know, close to re recession proof because of how the market is, uh, job growth um, and whatnot? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's kind of tough to say recession proof, but I do think that uh, the risk reward factor is there, right? So to take an example, if I'm buying in a place like Austin that we've went over the factors of what's happening there that make it a more resilient location, I should also expect a lower kind of reward because I'm not taking on a great amount of risk, right? So let's say the cash on cash return I should be expecting uh, is maybe in the range of like six to 8%, right? Now, if I buy in a place like Detroit, Right, which might, which has been losing uh, uh, citizens uh, or like residents kind of every year, right? Going to places like Texas or Florida, so on and so forth. I should be expecting a 20% cash on cash return, right? And so my kind of risk reward is, is, is in balance, right? So if I want to be able to take a little bit more risk and be compensated for that risk, maybe you buy in a place like Detroit, if you want to be kind of more safe which is our kind of goal, just given the numbers that we're playing with, uh, tend to be relatively high. And um, our just strategy and our temperament and our approach is to be more in a, a risk-averse environment. Then we look at kind of, it, of Austin uh, is that type of place. Austin can still be hit, right? But I don't believe that it can be hit as hard as a place like Detroit, given the kind of diversity of jobs, the average salaries, um, and, and those types of factors. Yeah, I totally agree with your strategy, picking good markets, good asset at the right price point. <clears throat> I think those are still good investments. And I know our focus is on real estate, but I also want to touch on up on other investment um, asset classes. I know because I believe like a good investor should be a diversified investor. So I wanted to get your view on crypto and also um, should a real estate investors. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, my kind of uh, broad advice uh, to people in this kind of, I don't think it's contrarian, but um, probably investing in crypto, it's somewhere in the rate of, let's say, 1% to 5% of your total net worth can be a good bet. Uh, the reason being is that it is such a, um, it has such asymmetric upside, right? So if you are, you know, investing 1% of your net worth, in something like Bitcoin and the upside on Bitcoin, if you look at the total addressable market is something like, you know, potentially 10,000 X, then it's probably uh, a good bet. Again, taking a very, very small portion of your net worth and investing in something like that. Uh, but I always kind of uh, stress the importance of understanding what you're investing in. So, you know, before doing something like that, you would probably want to go read uh, the Bitcoin white paper uh, by Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, I think there's a guy, uh, Jameson Lopp, who has a really good website, which goes through all of kind of like the Bitcoin mechanics, uh, what it means, 
uh, what does money mean? All of those kinds of things that one is just interesting, but two also gives you a deeper understanding of crypto. Uh, the ethos of crypto, I kind of completely um, agree in, which is kind of like, you know, this decentralized aspect of money. Um, in a certain extent, it's a decentralized version of the internet. Um, and so I really, really believe in the, the ethos of it. But, you know, just what's going on today with the printing of uh, over $4 trillion of money uh, injected into the economy by the Fed, um, you know, crypto seems like a, a decent alternative for some people that are looking to invest in maybe some uh, asset classes that have asymmetric upside. Yeah, that, that's really a good tip because I know you worked with a billionaire and helped him leave the crypto early stage tech, right? So right, right, right. That was my small stint in, in venture capital was working for uh, one of the co-creators of Ethereum to kind of um, lead his investments into uh, early stage technology. Mm -hmm. So that's really a good tip to have like one to five percent of the portfolio in crypto. And we'll leave in the show notes like where, you know, people should, should could study up on what they should read up on before investing in crypto. Yeah, absolutely. This is not investment advice. <laughs> you also really um, um, look to you to surround yourself with the right people. So can you also give some tips on that and what you're doing to surround yourself with good people? Like, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think a lot of it starts with uh, you know, just uh, studying the people and reading the people's thoughts that are no longer alive, right? So you can read books uh, about so many people like Ben Franklin, Nikola Tesla, whoever, really that you might gather inspiration from. And it's a good way to kind of not make your own mistakes, right? You can learn from other people's mistakes. One, that accelerates your learning curve. Two, it saves you a whole lot of money. Uh, two, uh, you know, for me specifically, I have two great partners at JT Capital, uh, both Sapin Talati and Pooja Talati. Um, you know, when we had first met, we had joint mentored on some deals. Uh, and through, um, you know, kind of working together on those deals, we had really just built up a really good relationship. We had very aligned values. Um, just as importantly, we had very complementary strengths and weaknesses. So we're able to kind of determine here's why we would have a good re working relationship. Um, and then outside of that, I think it's kind of just filling in the expertise, right? So for example, you know, our loan broker is not just a loan broker, but she's like a very good friend of ours, an advisor. She helps us out on things that have nothing to do with the actual debt side of the equation, just because she has so much experience in real estate and has worked on a significant number of deals as well as deals in high value. Um, and then again, having the people like a good tax person, a good legal counsel, all of those kinds of things, uh, and really just, um, you know, spending the time with them and kind of asking the very basic questions uh, that help you kind of understand things more deeply. And if you come at these things from a beginner not, beginner's mindset, or you're very naive about them, and you ask about things from first principles, you'll begin to learn a lot of things. Uh, one, because you're able to kind of gather all of their knowledge but at the same time, you're able to ask very basic questions that help them think about things from a different mindset. Um, so building a team is, you know, I, I'd say extremely important. Um, it can be very um, disastrous to go into uh, business or have a partner uh, with someone that you're not aligned with because these things are kind of like a mini marriage uh, and it takes time to be able to unravel uh, some of the partnerships that don't work out. Great. Well, you're definitely a wealth of knowledge and I can just talk to you forever, <laughs> but I think we uh, should probably um, open up to some Q&A. But before we do that, I'd love to um, ask you some questions so um, our viewers can get to know you a little bit more personally. So I'd like to find out uh, what is or was your favorite restaurant in San Francisco? Um, I had so many. Uh, so I really liked A16, uh, which was in the marina. Uh, great pizza. Um, we used to um, uh, love um, uh, Pizza Del Vina because when we lived in Pack Heights. Oh, yeah. Say that because <laughs> you lived in Pack Heights. Yeah, yeah. That was on uh, Fillmore, right? Mm -hmm. There was one on Fillmore, I think. Yeah, yeah. I love that place. That was good. Uh, I'm a big fan of the brick oven pizza. Uh, so, yeah, that was uh, probably our favorite, I would say. What's your favorite or book that has impacted you the most? Um, 
Probably two. So one is uh, Sapiens uh, by Yuval Noah Harari, I think is how you say his name. A really good book just about um, kind of like the, the history of the world. Um, pretty, um, has really stuck with me. Um, one is um, Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, I believe, believe it's called, by uh, Rene Girard. That was, um, you know, Rene Girard is a... a uh, I believe it was a French philosopher taught at Stanford, uh, kind of is famous for uh, mimetic theory. That's a very impactful uh, lens for me to view the world through. Um, and then lastly, um, probably Poor Charlie's Almanac uh, by Charlie Munger, which is really just a collection of talks by Charlie Munger. Uh, over time, he is um, uh, the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Business's uh, business partner, Warren Buffett's business partner, rather. <laughs> I haven't read that. I'll definitely check that out. So uh, last question. Do you have any um, daily or morning routines? Uh, yeah, I love my morning routine. Uh, so uh, pretty much what I do is I wake up, uh, I go work out uh, at the gym. I will um, sit in the sauna for 20 minutes after the workout. Uh, and then after that, I'll do a cold shower. Uh, I'll come home. I will, um, I what was doing coffee. Uh, I've kind of stopped the coffee routine now. Um, I take a drink called Magic Mind. Uh, it has a lot of like nootropics in it. It's just like a small shot um, from uh, the guy who created it was um, James Bashara, who is a founder in San Francisco and now angel investor. He lives in LA. Um, and then after that, I will um, do kind of a little bit of writing um, just about how I feel what I'm planning on doing for the day. Uh, I'll read through the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. Um, and then after that, I'll just go through kind of my to-do list of things I need to do. Um, and that's how my morning gets started. Do you do any meditation? So some personal development with meditation? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I really want to get into it. I downloaded the um, Waking Up app with Sam Harris, uh, but I just haven't done it. I always think about it. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, over to the Q&A, we got one question. I don't think, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Memphis and Tennessee area. Um, what do you think about the Memphis and Tennessee area in general? Um, yeah, I don't have, you know, too much detailed information on those areas. One thing I would say just in that general location in Tennessee, uh, it's a tertiary market, right? So it is one of these places that uh, let's say Nashville in particular, that people are moving to, right? Uh, particularly you have, uh, you know, 75 millennials or so, right? A significant portion of these, uh, let's say the, the, the group that is maybe the, the most ambitious uh, and kind of young is in a place like San Francisco or New York. And now some of them are moving specifically to Nashville is one of those categories of cities that I was mentioning, like Austin or a Denver. Um, and Nashville seems to be a tertiary market, right? Yeah where you have this ability to potentially get some of those returns that are, you know, 7% plus, right? But then you're also taking on a, a certain level of perceived risk with that. Um, so I don't have, you know, too much outside of that, but I do view it as kind of one of those uh, tertiary markets where you'll get higher cash on cash return in some of the coastal cities, uh, maybe even a little bit higher return than a place like Austin or Dallas, but then uh, consequently you're also taking on a, a little bit greater risk. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, our next question from our viewer uh, comes from Jefferson Gann. Uh, Jefferson, I believe, is a, a multifamily investor as well. Um, so here's this question. Some people have different definition of class B properties. Uh, depending on who you talk to, for, for you, what is your criteria of class B property? Yeah. Uh, so I look at a uh, really good question. I look at class B properties is built in, let's call it the mid 1980s to the early 2000s, probably no later than let's say 2004. Um, now the, the caveat to that is there's little to no deferred maintenance on it, meaning that the quality of the property has been kept up. And if I look at the, go look at the property, I probably don't need to spend more than let's say 50 grand to kind of um, you know, fix things on the exterior of the building. But you know, even if you had a property that was built in 1990, you go in, the wood is rotting on the outside, the roofs are in terrible condition, 
then I would probably designate that more as a class C plus property, right? Uh, but class B I look at is mid 1980s to, to early 2000s and then has been um, kind of kept in good condition. I would say also location uh, has a factor as well for the class uh, B. Yeah, I look at location slightly differently in that um, the property I look at in, in a silo, right? It's class A, class B, C, D, and then location is class A, B, C, D, right? So if I can get a class B property in a class A location, then I'm very happy because I know that, you know, I kind of have an asset here that is um, a little bit older, but it is in a great location. And if it's in a great location, there's primarily new construction there. And so they have much higher costs, which means they need to have much higher rental prices. For the class B, uh, given that I'm, you know, most likely buying it at a discount versus those new properties, I don't need to have rents as high as some of the other people in the area, which allows me to hopefully provide value to residents, but not charge such high rents as some of the other competitors may be doing. Okay. Okay. So, so questions. You've talked about investments in Florida and Texas. Where else are you investing and plan to focus for future investments? Um, yeah, so our focus is Austin and Dallas. Um, we like to stay just laser focused on, on a particular market. We'll take a look around, you know, what is happening in other parts of the country. But unless something kind of, you know, really changes our mind set or shifts our, our way of thinking, then we like to focus on the particular market that, that we're in. We believe it's the best way to kind of build a competitive advantage. It allows us to kind of uh, take advantage of economies of scale and things like that. Uh, an example of that is, is we've been buying up more properties in Austin. We've been now get, been able to kind of negotiate um, great price points on some of the unit renovations that we do for things like granite or flooring or those kinds of things. And obviously all of those savings pass along to, to our investors in the form of you know, increased distributions. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, another question about the Florida area. Um, it's, so um, you're investing in Florida. Can you elaborate what area in Florida? Yeah, um, so Orlando and Melbourne are the two places, uh, and Jacksonville are the places that we've invested in in Florida. Um, you know, I think going forward, probably our acquisition approach is not going to be a continued investment in Florida and really just a focus on, on Austin and Dallas. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll save that one for last. And since I have friends live in Georgetown, outskirts of Austin, have you looked in those areas as well? Do you see opportunities in those areas? Yeah, uh, definitely. So uh, I just moved to Round Rock, which is kind of a small suburb uh, outside of Austin, about like 25 to 30 minutes outside of downtown Austin. Um, there's, you know, multifamily in that area. Georgetown is kind of right next to Round Rock. Uh, so definitely those kind of outskirts is where we, we look because the population growth continues to, to kind of grow in those areas. Now, one thing we always zone in on is average home prices in the area. Um, average rents of competitors in the area, and then average rents that we would be charging. In some of these places, the equation hasn't yet worked out yet that the home prices are high enough to be, us to be able to justify a rental, um, rental price at a property. So that's one thing we always look at, which is, is good for investors to know. Okay, great. Um, I think we just have couple more. Um, I'm liquidating my single families in Bay Area, reinvesting in multifamily, looking at Florida, Texas, and Tennessee. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, you know, I, it, it's hard to, to kind of provide um, the thoughts or guidance without uh, having kind of the additional context and nuance. Um, you know, one thing I would say is that as you're liquidating your single family rentals in the Bay Area, um, you know, just being cognizant of not selling them at a discount right now. I don't entirely know how things are going, um, specifically as it relates to sales. Um, so if you're still selling at kind of like that premium that San Francisco can charge, then, you know, that's probably great because rental prices have dropped somewhat, right? Um, and you're looking at a place where now you can maybe reinvest those profits in places that have uh, a more business-friendly environment, uh, tax friendly, so on and so forth. Um, 
And, you know, looking at places like Atlanta, Florida, Texas, Tennessee, again, those tier two tertiary markets can be good. Mm -hmm. um, I would just, you know, probably need a little bit more context to help, whether you're passively investing, whether you're actively investing and in things like that. Okay, great. And just la last two questions, we will be um, careful of your time. So what are the min minimum number of units you would buy? Um, so we have kind of two verticals in our uh, company. So one is uh, 150 to kind of 600 units. Um, so that's for our larger deals where we're, we're raising money from anywhere from, let's say, five investors to maybe up to 50 investors. Uh, and we're purchasing properties that are, let's say, minimum $20 million uh, and then probably up in the range of like, you know, close to over $100 million. That's one vertical. Uh, the second vertical we have is where we structure more kind of JV partnerships. So this is one individual investor typically says, hey, I want to go buy a deal. I want it to be a smaller deal. And then I want to buy and hold it. For those ones, we'll usually look anywhere from in the range of, let's say, a minimum of 20 to 30 units. And then the maximum of kind of uh, up to 150 units. Okay, great, thank you. And this is the last question, but it's a, it's a good one. Um, great interview, thank you. In mul one, in multifamily investment, what are, in your view, the biggest downside? And number two, with the currency devaluation that might come due to, because of Fed balance expansion, um, what may be a good portfolio in addition to multifamily? Yeah, so I think probably the biggest bear case for multifamily will be uh, the amount of millennials that might be in a position to purchase homes, right? So if I was looking at this from a, a pessimistic uh, viewpoint as it relates specifically to multifamily investment, I would say there's 75 million uh, millennials. A uh, portion of those are now getting into the stage where they are focusing on uh, building families and having families. Therefore, they will, they will want a lot more room. Uh, they've also uh, accumulated some portion of purchasing power. Therefore, they will want to go, uh, you know, buy a house and do all of those kinds of things. Uh, we've kind of mitigated that risk or looked at other trends by saying, well, you still have a significant portion of millennials that are not in that situation. And then also you have a significant portion of uh, immigrants who primarily are one of the other demographics that are uh, partial to renting uh, due to a variety of factors. Um, but I would say that's probably the biggest um, like bear case or pessimistic view uh, that I would put on multifamily. Um, yeah, and yeah, these are a couple of great questions. So uh, as it relates to kind of the, the balance sheet expansion and, and the printing of money um, from a multifamily and just real estate in general perspective, it, real estate has always been an, an, uh, a hedge against inflation, right? So um, based like generally historically, um, if you believe that all this money printing will lead to inflation, uh, which is, you know, potentially a very good argument to be made, then real estate can be a good inflation against he uh, a good hedge against inflation. Uh, two, given where interest rates are at and Jerome Powell and the Fed signaling that they'll keep interest rates uh, at zero until 2023, you also have an environment where people can uh, kind of, uh, you know, raise debt very cheaply long-term fixed rate debt with uh, an asset is typically always a winning equation. Um, and then outside of that, um, I think that question was what might be a good portfolio in addition to multifamily? Um, I would just look at other cash flowing assets, right? So if you can, um, or in a position to maybe like buy a small business that has a local monopoly on an area such as a landscaping business or a plumbing business, and you kind of know enough of what you're doing, those are really good businesses to invest in because they are very um, kind of resistant to a lot of the macroeconomic factors. Uh, and they have just been um, obviously resistant during this year as home services has continued to rise. Uh, so I would say more broadly, just cash flowing assets uh, are mm -hmm. always a good opportunity um, when you kind of look at what's going on from a, a Fed perspective. Great. And I wanted to also touch up on the point you were talking about, you know, that trend, because there's 75 million millennials kind of entering that family stage. So I actually did start looking at um, horizontal multifamily to see if that makes sense. Like just mm -hmm. 
batch of homes, like single family homes as like mm -hmm. a multifamily because there are, yeah, 75 million of them are entering that stage to complement a vertical, uh, vertical multifamily. Hopefully. Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, Open Door, uh, which is a company um, based out of San Francisco, or actually I think Arizona now, which is, um, uh, you know, kind of streamlining the home buying and selling process. They just went public through a SPAC. Um, and, and one of their big, one part of their thesis is that you have all of these millennials. Uh, I wrote about it last week in my newsletter. And then the other uh, thing to think about is uh, companies like Blackstone have raised uh, close to kind of, you know, nine to 10 figure funds to go build houses specifically mm -hmm. with the goal of renting them to all of these millennials. Uh, and so there's other, um, you know, people that also kind of see these trends and then they place their bets in significant ways. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Rohan. I feel like I can just talk to you for a long time about real estate investing. Um, but, you know, so thank you very much for being on and sharing on, you know, all your expertise. So, yes. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. We'll have to do it again. Yeah, thanks again. Hey, thanks for letting us pick your brains. I mean, you're a wealth of knowledge. You're walking encyclopedia almost too. <laughs> so um, maybe in the future, we'll welcome you back for another interview. Maybe uh, uh, we can dive in a little deeper into maybe your future, um, your future um, you know, assets that you guys are uh, investing in. Yes, absolutely. Sounds good. Uh, thanks so much for having me.